light within our hearts, light within our thoughts, light within our words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I'm Sister Who. With me today on the show, I have my good friend David Slater, who is a spiritual counselor and intuitive. And the wonderful topic we get to discuss now and see where it will go <laughs> is freedom and control. Ah. There seem to be a lot of people, at least that I run into, for those who seem to be a little more knowledgeable about such things, I guess. And I'm not I'm not meaning that to sound snobbish or condescending, though it probably does, but we kind of look at each other and raise our eyebrows and just whisper, yeah, so-and-so has control issues. And, of course, we know what we mean by that. This show, of course, is where we're trying to talk about, okay, what does that mean? To have control issues, and conversely, what is true freedom? Is, is true freedom and having control issues mutually exclusive uh, things. I'm tempted to say they are because I'm not sure that you can have true freedom while allowing even a single control issue to endure within your life. Yeah. My take on control for me has always been that control at its very best is an illusion. Mm. Um, what I find freedom is a, a delightful word to experiment with what i find it, uh, when human beings grant each other freedoms we, and another thing we've spoken of when you can be blunt with a person when you can be direct with someone is a freedom that they hopefully have granted you and you already have the <laughs> control if you wish to understand that there's already a mutual respect so what they're saying is something that will bring more of you out not mm. um, not something that is meant to demean or or um, hurt the person in any way, shape, or form. I knew a, a pair of guys that were friends, had been friends for 40 plus years. And they were um, contractors okay. and grew up in the industry with their own separate businesses, but they always interacted because they were such close friends. After 40 plus years, one of them uh, had developed um, diabetes and okay. had wound up losing a leg okay and because of poor circulation but because of the poor circulation well the the friend shows up at the hospital and um sees the family all gathered around in mourning for his leg and um, the 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 shades are drawn and really dour looks and the whole works and the friend knows him so well he, he walks in and he says nice room you've got here man this must cost you an arm and a leg oh i see they've already started to collect well the family of course they've already started to collect okay because he had his leg removed oh and, um so the, the family allegedly to pay the hospital bill exactly well the family of course was offended and there was this mutual gasp mm -hmm. his friend laughed so hard he was crying in laughter mm -hmm in a hospital trying to recuperate. And he's gonna recuperate so much better with a laughter than he will f with people going, oh, this is terrible, oh, bad, terrible. And his friend knew him so well. And he had those freedoms granted by his friend that he could say something as outlandish as that to care for his own friend mm -hmm. in spite of <laughs> the majority in the room. Freedom for me is something that gets so easily expressed and so delightfully expressed in relationship between two people or a group of mm. people and to where you can say things that aren't safe. <laughs> yeah. The added distinction to all that, because I, I still see the two as running very parallel, freedom mm -hmm. and control. To have control issues doesn't mean, or, or to not have control issues doesn't mean that you never exercise control. Okay. To have a control issue, to me, suggests that there is an attachment to being able to control, that there is an attachment to being in control, even in those situations when freedom will serve you much, much better. Mm -hmm. If I'm responsible for putting on a show, for example, 
I try to control all the details to make the show as good as possible because there's a sense in which I, I want to do my best and bring the best quality effort to it. Uh -huh. If I have a reliable team to help me, however, I delegate things and I trust them to get the job done. Uh -huh. And I don't have a, a control issue in the sense of needing to micromanage what they're doing because by doing that, I'll, I'll wind up communicating that I don't really trust them. Exactly. But if we can take control and weave it with freedom to say, this is the way I've laid it out, and you get this piece, and you get this piece, and you get this piece, what do you need to do your best in each of those areas? I give them the freedom to integrate their creativity mm -hmm. and ingenuity. Mm -hmm. I leave a, a minimum amount of control by saying who's going to handle which area, but in embracing that integration, mm -hmm. I, th I hope what I'm demonstrating is that what matters most is simply doing a good job. And allowing the freedoms to, to come out in the process. Mm -hmm. This, Well, to recognize that freedom serves the outcome better than micromanaging. Absolutely. I, this conversation is a prime example <laughs> okay when you started to speak i thought i have no clue what the topic is <laughs> um and for a control freak um that might be a little disconcerting um, you don't impress me as a control freak oh no no for me mm -hmm. control um connotes expectation okay and and again, expectation can be considered a, a bad word or, or whatever. And I'm not so certain of that. But when you can let go of expectation at times or let go of control in lieu of possibilities, freedom, it, it's a remarkable mix in things because... See, I would actually recommend weaving them all together but leaving them open-ended. Yes. You know, and, uh, which for some people may sound like a contradiction in terms of open-ended control. <laughs> or open-ended expectation. This or, or open-ended expectations. This or more. What's mm -hmm. the difference between open-ended expectations and hope? I'm not sure. Somebody challenged me on the control thing before because I, I tend to approach everything as a planner. You know, not as a spontaneous, we'll make it up as we go. But I, I like to think ahead and inventory the details and try to arrange them in the most cohesive and productive arrangement I can. Uh -huh. And someone was in one particular situation was recommending to me that I lower my expectations. <laughs> and as I, as I kept pondering it, it, it made me wonder, can you lower your expectations and still have aspirations? Uh -huh. Or does having aspirations pretty much require some minimum configuration of expectations. You know, that when I show up and work hard, it is specifically because I expect the work to accomplish something. To see it in a group of people, it's, it's wonderful to see. My personal experience, I'm the person who, if you hand me a microphone and tell me to, you need something done with a microphone, as far as emceeing something, happy. I, I, that, okay. I don't need any more advance notice than that. Or weeks, it doesn't matter. Okay. But one thing I don't do so well is do the planning. And I've actually okay. been in situations where someone said, okay, here's the plan, and they hand me an outline. Mm -hmm. If they handed me a script, of course, with no advanced warning, they're not going to get the script back <laughs> as they're, they're saying it. But to do that in a group is delightful. But what's amazing is to do it within yourself. Okay. So, for instance, how long ago had we decided on this topic? Um, and it was quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, the plan was there. And that's wonderful to have. But with the plan that you put together, with this show being put together, and you did this and did a marvelous job of doing this, you've also Thank granted you. me the freedom to say, you know, when the whole thing started, I didn't know what we were going to talk about. And you laugh. And again, that's a wonderful thing to have inside yourself, it's wonderful to see outside yourself, both the freedom and the control. Well, and I think it's important to give each person the freedom, I, you know, myself as well, I guess, but especially every guest. We don't script these shows because I never know what <laughs> insights are going to come out. Uh, absolutely. 
And if, I know that if I try to micromanage something, I will wind up strangling it. Uh -huh. if I, so I have to loosen the control, but I also have to provide a launching pad. Mm -hmm. And so I try to give enough control to shape the launching pad, mm -hmm. but not so much that I put a jar over it <laughs> to contain everything that happens on that launching pad. Right. You know, which essentially would prevent, if it That's were a purpose. rocket, <laughs> it would prevent anything from taking off. Uh-huh. So I, I feel responsible mm -hmm. to create the launching pad, and I control the creation of that launching pad. Uh -huh. But I strive to leave it open-ended so that whatever is born within that moment will have all the freedom it needs to go wherever it needs to go. You used a very wonderful okay. word there, responsible. Um, okay. Again, our, uh, our dear friend, the, um, Carrie, that we know, um, okay. she told me, think about the word responsible is simply able to respond. Mm -hmm. Response able. Uh, yes, exactly. Many people take responsible as being something you must control. I must control every contingency, every possible question that comes up. It seems to me those people are not actually <laughs> responding as much as they are reacting. Exactly. And the difference between react and respond uh, perhaps is, is, is somewhat similar to the difference between control and freedom. It, it, exactly. You know, like any tool, they can be used or abused. Uh -huh. Reacting, it seems to me, will always leave you on the short end of the stick, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to react because we don't have any advance notice. If we know we have the freedom to use all the resources within ourselves mm -hmm. to bring the fullness of who and what I am and everything I can do, whether people know that I can do it or not, to bring all of that to the challenge, that freedom allows the transformation of the reaction into a response. Uh -huh. Is that something you found in your work also? Yes. When you're dealing with squishy topics, <laughs> like what we're, we're speaking of quite frequently. Um, things topics that have lots of possibilities. Exactly. Uh, not that are malleable and, and can take many forms. And they're not reliant on, on empirical evidence. Okay. Um, you can say things that will offend people. Because they want things to be a certain way. Uh, or um, they had an experience 20 minutes before you said it that has their mind working a certain way, mm. and what you said struck them funny. Or reminded them of their history. Exactly. And when the person comes to you and says, this really offended me, if I take an adversarial role, trying to take control, mm -hmm. not much positive can come out of it. It's like, oh, you know what? To be honest with you, I could, I could understand how you arrived at that place. Let's speak more of this. And again, now we're going from control to freedoms because the person who brings that to you has first of all the courage to say hey this offended me to match in courage and say oh let's let's speak of this and to also have the freedom and the courage and the uh, ability to respond to say you know i totally blew that one <laughs> to be honest with you i knew that about you or any number of things in doing so continue the conversation because sometimes able to respond isn't able to deflect isn't able to bury. But, but if you're embracing truth, uh -huh. I don't know that freedom has to be feared. And I oh, don't, absolutely. you know, in, in responding to what superficially may sound adversarial, responding with a question, responding with an invitation for more information. You know, when someone says, that really offended me, to instead of saying, you know, oh, I'm terribly sorry, you know, guilty, guilty me or something, uh -huh. or you know, well, I'm sorry you're so sensitive, you know, suddenly being defensive, uh -huh. to instead say, what was it about it that offended you? Uh -huh. And, you know, inviting them to explore their own history. You know, in a sense, you're inviting them to give themselves the freedom to embrace the truth of their lives. Mm -hmm. And if they are genuinely feeling offended, then to allow them that experience. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and without being condescending to say, and, and what does that do for you? Mm -hmm. You know, I know that I didn't mean it to be offensive, but if you took it to be offensive, there must be some reason and mm -hmm. hopefully something we can learn from that. I've played it safe so many times in my life, and now I don't do that anymore. Okay. Um, 
because of that, I know I'm going to push people. I'm going to upset them. I'm going to do any number of things to include just the opposite. Some people will spend a short amount of time with me and they're excited, they're elated, they're whatever. And those are their choices. I didn't do that for them. We just set a stage to have the adventure. We enjoyed the adventure. The point being is that if I'm to think that I'm never going to offend anyone or stir someone, I think I've chosen the wrong line of work. If you're going to make people think, you have to be, you have to allow for the possibility of all emotions occurring at any point in, in frequently in unpredictable ways. A, a very brilliant man told me that one time, that the work of an artist is to get someone to emote. Uh, in the old black and white uh, movie Inherit the Wind with um, Spencer Tracy made, uh -huh. I don't know how many years ago, there's, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, there's a conversation with a newspaper man and I think Spencer Tracy was playing a judge and he asked him the purpose of the, of the media mm -hmm. and the newspaper man responded that it was to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> I love that statement. Um, yes. You know, that there's, we need to be prompted to think. People who have control issues need to be challenged to let go of the control mm -hmm. and to embrace the freedom. People who are stumbling under the weight of too much freedom mm -hmm. may need to embrace an appropriate amount of control to move from being a, a jellyfish tossed on the waves. Yeah to being a human form that can dance on the beach. Uh -huh. You know, it, it's not so much that there need to be one or the other, but there are so many ways in which I have observed people with control issues who think they are trying to save or manage a situation who don't seem to realize that, that what they're actually doing is strangling the situation, mm -hmm. that they're holding on to it so tightly, it doesn't have the freedom to spread its wings. Absolutely. The, again, going back to the responsible thing, people say, well, it all falls on me. And it's like, only if you're attaching an ego to it. Well, now, I guess my first thought when you said that was, and, and what are you going to do with it? Right. Um, what response are you going to offer? Right. And going back to, again, the control of strangling the heck out of something. And yeah, are you demanding an outcome or are you making a contribution? Right. I, um, my, Both of them involve control. Yeah. My mom was a florist. So as a kid, okay. I went to a lot of weddings. And I remember seeing a bride pacing out her wedding with a stopwatch. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, and you already know it's going to be a really lousy wedding because of that. And Has life ever consented to operate <laughs> by a stopwatch? Track meets. <laughs> well, it only tells you how long or how fast they ran. Uh-huh. But it doesn't actually control the track meet because everyone who's ever participated in such an event knows that there are innumerable variables. Uh-huh. You know, everything from the wind and the dust to the temperature to slipping on a piece of gravel, almost but not quite clearing the hurdle as you go over it. Uh -huh. I, I mean, in, in some ways, I, I jokingly sometimes have told people that Murphy's Law seems to be the only one that still works. <laughs> you know, that anything can go wrong, anything that can go wrong will and at the worst possible moment. And there's all kinds of wonderful variations on it. But, But the point being, as long as that's out there, we control the response. We can't control the outcome. Mm -hmm. We give freedom to the participation and to the response. But freedom doesn't make sense within a situation where there is no freedom for the outcome to be anything other than what the administrator has decreed. Right. I mean, there is no freedom unless you're willing to downshift the control a bit. Uh-huh. 
you know, there is an appropriate amount of control, but excessive control only leads to disaster. Mm -hmm. It seems to me the same can be said for freedom, though. There is an appropriate amount of freedom, but excessive freedom winds up with disaster. Because there needs to be a certain Structure. guidance, yeah. uh, a certain multi-dimension, multi-generational contemplation. We're all, we're running down toward the end of the show here, but, and I'm not sure how easily this ties into it, except that it's these two terms seem to come up frequently in the conversation about it. In the past, I would occasionally hear the words generation gap. Ah. That on one hand, you have presumably, or, or typically, you have an older generation trying to control and a younger generation trying to reach for more freedom. Uh-huh. And where the term generation gap begins to be employed is usually when the two are not communicating particularly well with each other. Uh -huh. Where the youth are failing to see the wisdom of the tradition and to integrate it, re you know, update it, whatever they need to do, but, but not to totally dismiss it. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the older generation possibly seeing the established forms as the most effective and wisest ones because they haven't communicated with the younger generation enough to know how the needs for freedom have changed. Uh -huh. That the freedoms that are needed now are not the same freedoms that were needed when the older generation were, were youth. Mm -hmm. That the needs for freedom change from one generation to the next. And consequently, the needs for control need to shift and change also. Mm -hmm. um, another aspect we touched on briefly was the expectation thing. I had a, a wonderful experience when someone recently thanked me for being so patient. Okay. And I thought, wait a second, I didn't access any patience. And it was a fun little thought process because I went through and I realized patience where it is a virtue it's a delightful thing to uh, exercise okay but isn't needed when you have no expectation or measurement of time when if you have no measurement of time you won't actually even notice whether you waited a long time or a short time exactly so patience okay. becomes irrelevant the thing that becomes wonderful in that is the relationship that me and this uh, person were having was one that I chose as an adventure. Okay. I didn't I didn't know where it was going to go, didn't know what was going to be contained in it, nor what was, you know, uh, expectations. What's sometimes were. called a wait and see attitude. Exactly. And okay. so I had no expectation in the whole thing. And Whereas they were measuring this in, uh, inconvenience and that inconvenience and this inconvenience, and I was there to help them mm -hmm. and had set the day aside um, for something that probably would have normally taken 45 minutes to an hour. As it got longer, I was fine. And so, again, you, you've mentioned it, about... It did come to a positive resolution, I hope? Or? Oh, yeah. Everything worked out. But the biggest thing, there was no adversarial role or any conflict because there was no concern. A task needed to be completed with no expectation as to what, you know, a, a time or Which anything like that. seems to bring us back to controlling the contribution rather than trying to control the outcome. Uh-huh. And giving yeah. freedom to the, cre to the ingenuity and the creativity in the beginning rather than giving excessive freedom to the process after that point when more guidance is needed. In reference to the, the so-called generation gap, what this speaks to is the elders valuing the ingenuity of the youth uh -huh. and the ingenuity of the youth paying attention to the long, hard, struggle to arrive at reliable information to guide the process. Mm -hmm. You know, that that the dynamics they may be tempted to take for granted were actually hammered out by hundreds, if not thousands, of years of trial and error. Yes. 
And, many and brains unless and they brains. want to remake all of the mistakes again, <laughs> it would make sense to pay attention and to build upon the knowledge that is already available. Yeah. Indeed, absolutely. No need to reinvent anything. We have the freedom to remember as well as the freedom to discover. Mm -hmm. The freedom to remember, however, is, is perhaps one that is more often forgotten. Absolutely. In any case, thank you very much for everything you shared today. Uh, another quick conversation, I guess, on a complex topic that hopefully people will be discussing for a long time to come. I intend to. <laughs> thank you. You bet. And thank all of you for watching.